Hi, everybody. Welcome to the LMN webinar. My name is Dave Chalmers, Chief Commercial Officer at LMN. We have an amazing speaker today, Frank Bork, talking to us about how to quickly adapt to change and increase efficiency in your landscape business. I'm just going to take a moment to introduce Frank to everybody. One of uh, the landscape industry's top business coaches, and Frank is also an LMN certified uh, consultant. He's been part of the green industry for over 22 years as a business owner with an extensive background in hardscape construction. Uh, today, Frank spends a lot of his time uh, coaching and speaking at some of the largest conferences and contractor events throughout the United States and Canada. Uh, some examples, Hardscape North America, GIE Expo, and Landscape Ontario Congress, just to name a few. Frank is dedicated in, help, in helping landscape business owners and teams improve efficiency, their systems, profits, and best of all, their quality of life. Frank, welcome. Thank you so much. We're really looking forward to this session today. I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you so much. I, I'm really um, happy to be here today. Uh, today, my topic is a topic that I think is very relevant to the industry uh, at this moment in time with what we're living. Uh, how to quickly adapt to change and improving efficiency is going to be more important, I think, than ever, not only for ourselves as business owners, but also for our team. Helping our team to adapt um, to business is one thing, but helping our team adapt to life, uh, the, the new normal that we're going to be living, I think is very important that we have that discussion. So today, I want to have that discussion with you, and um, thank you for everyone who is here. It's a great opportunity for me to, uh, to share uh, some of this information. Generally, if you're here today, it's because uh, you are a leader in the, um, in the team. You might be the business owner. And in my view, everybody wins when the, the leader gets better. So when you're attending webinars, you're getting information, you're learning a new skill, you're taking the time to make your life better, um, you become a better leader, you're better able to deal and cope with situations. And so this is not only helpful to you, to your family, to your team family uh, at, uh, in the business, but it's also inspiring. And people want to follow leaders in the industry. People are uh, more than ever looking at the leaders and wanting to learn from them, follow them in what they're uh, doing. And so my focus today in this presentation is going to be talking to you about my observation in the industry right now, my discussions that I've had with colleagues, with clients who, has, who have landscape businesses, probably just like yours. Um, every business is different. Every business has its challenges and every business owner has decisions to make to be able to adapt in your, own, in your own way. But this presentation is really aimed at uh, helping you take a position to see where you're at in the process of adaptation, to see what, how you are adapting, and hopefully to provide you with some tools that uh, will help you to better adapt to the situation and any possible challenges, uh, crisis that might be ahead um, that we don't necessarily know is, uh, is there. So there's a lot of unknowns, a lot of uncertainties, um, but it's uh, together, you know, I saw the other day the quote, together we can get better, absolutely. And I think more than ever, we see people coming together um, to learn, to, to see just because it's, it's it's unprecedented where we're all in the same position. We all know or don't know what's gonna happen. So only one thing is certain is that we're all uncertain. And so it, it brings us closer. In times like these, no matter how tough it can get, the positive out of it is we can all help each other just by being there. And that being said, we're also all different. 
So in my observations with uh, my clients, my colleagues, and just people in the industry right now, what I've noticed is that we can categorize people in four different styles or patterns of how people are adapting. And it's pretty interesting because I've had the conversation the other day with a friend and uh, to see where they were at in the process. Because when I'm helping a client, I wanna figure out where they are in this process of change, in this process of adaptation. Um, so if we take this, uh, this example, in my mind, there's first there's four different patterns. When something happens, such as a crisis, uh, or a difficult situation, or a challenge within the business, we have a tendency to deal with it in, in different ways. Some people collaborate, they connect with people, they go get the help, they bring in the right team members, they build teams to deal with the issue, right? Then you have people who are more reserved. They tend to just want to, uh, um, you know, to stay home, take some time to reflect on what's going on. Um, they might feel a bit uh, afraid. They might not want to be social at all. Some people um, kind of, retract and do their own thing when when they are afraid some other people get creative i mean some people this is where they shine they start looking for new ideas um, looking for solutions new ways of doing things so that's always interesting and then you always you also have uh, people who are very um or patterns where people are looking for ideas. So they'll do anything, you know, it could be just, uh, they get in the action mode to, to, to see to see what's out there, what other people are doing. Personally, I do that every time and I start looking at other industries, what's going on, what are they doing? Sometimes when we're in our own bubble, we forget that uh, other people in, other types of jobs might be coming up with some pretty cool ideas that we can use in our own industry. So there's many ways to look at a situation, many different ways to, to go about dealing with a situation. But what I've noticed is that there's two extremes, right? On one extreme, you have adaptation styles where who are more passive, and on the other end, you have the more proactive methods. And if we take the higher, so that's that would be my first profile, my first style of adaptation to a situation. Well, the higher is the person who may feel overwhelmed, right? That person may be panic stricken, um, even, even paralyzed by this situation, worrying about what's gonna happen. They fear having more fear. Um, they want to just simply um, isolate themselves from the situation. And so by doing that, it's actually slowing down the process. But it's okay to stay there if it's just going to be temporary. For instance, I'll give you an example. Uh, myself, personally, I've lived uh, through a recession in 2008, 2009, where we had a company with over 100 employees. We had to scale back. Um, and it happened kind of gradually over the months we had more time to make changes and to adapt. It was still very stressful, but we had more time to adapt. Now what's happening right now is that everything is happening so quickly. So the challenge with that is trying to find a balance between making the right decisions, not moving too quickly, not moving too slowly. So it's the first time that I, I can really say that we're in a situation where we have to make decisions quickly and uh, not moving out quickly enough from this style of adaptation can have a serious impact on your decisions. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. But the hider um, is the person who may be paralyzed by the fear and is not doing much and tends to isolate. Isolate in even behind addiction sometimes, right? Uh, we can become addiction, addicted to uh, in the case of watching TV, sometimes that's the, that's that's what's happening to many people. We're, we're just hiding behind our problems, watching a lot more TV, maybe um, even just eating. We're, we're around the food all the time now. 
So we can get into the, all these bad patterns or be aware that it can be a pattern and, and a way of hiding behind the reality, which is not dealing with the situation. When we realize we're in that state, then we can take action and move to the next one. The next one being the observer is the person who no longer hiding and even looking outside to see what's going on out there. What are people doing? Um, how are people coping with it? And they are also trying to look at their options, trying to see what, how they can evaluate, assess their situation to find the best option for them before moving forward. Okay, so this is the observer phase or style pattern of adaptation. Then once the observer becomes uh, active and actually starts doing something to benefit his situation or to do something about his situation to put a plan in place, then he becomes more uh, of the connector style. The connector is connecting all the dots by connecting with people, maybe joining network groups, maybe finding a mentor, a coach, uh, other people in the industry who might be dealing with the same situation, finding solutions to their issues. So the connector is action driven and it's an action taker at this point. And then you have the innovator. So the innovator is not only an action taker, he may care about what people are doing outside, but he wants, that person usually wants to do that his own thing. He's not afraid of trying new things, of going forward, trying new technologies, new systems, new processes, even offering new services in the case of business and new ways of doing business. So it's, it's, it's a new, it's a, it's a level even further ahead than the connector, even more proactive than the connector. And this is where the opp opportunities lay in an economy uh, where we may have some um, unknowns and even more crisis maybe coming up is you really need to be on that side of the quadrant. You need to be a connector. You need to be an innovator in order to be able to um, see opportunities that are available to find opportunities to get to inspire your team you need to be in this side uh the more proactive side of things so my questions to you, my question to you right now and i'd love for you to um put your answer in the in the chat box but just to tell us in which uh, which style applies to you where do you see yourself uh, at the moment so not three weeks ago not last week but today, so maybe three weeks ago or two weeks ago, you were in a state that you were still hiding. Maybe you were afraid, maybe you were panicked. Um, I'd love to know how many of you are in which stage. And there's no judgment because I'll tell you right now, I've been in every one of those stages and there's some days when I have some challenges, I'll be the hider for, I'll give myself at least 10, 15 minutes, even an hour, sometimes even an afternoon just to watch a movie to, to completely disconnect from the issue that sometimes is helpful, but staying in that state for me more than uh, half a day is completely uh, energy draining. So I need to get out of that stage as soon as possible, but it is normal. So I'm um, just looking at the chat box here. Um, you know, we have different- uh, A number of innovators and connectors, Frank, and you know, yeah. that, that may be, Maybe uh, par for the course with respect to, to owner operators being being driven and being very proactive. Um, yeah. Is there maybe maybe some tips to share during obviously this this uncertain time? Um, connectors and innovators um, they move quickly. Uh, they make you know they make great decisions based on sometimes a, a lot of data or limited data. What what might be some tips that you can share if they have some team members that are maybe maybe observers or maybe hiders? How do they how do they stay connected um, and and on the same page with everybody when maybe we're all not uh, in the shop together as much as we used to be? Yeah. That's a, that's a great great question, and I just realized in the chat box people were coming out with innovators and. And that doesn't surprise me because when people are attending webinars, they're 
out there finding answers. Usually they're on the right side or on, on, on that side of being an innovator or an action taker, right? The connector. And so it doesn't surprise me. How to get someone from one side, like the observer or the hider to on the other side being the connector and the innovator? How do you get your team? Well, first and foremost, I think we have to do some of these things. And you, we have to share with our teams uh, this process and, and, and using this as a tool and tell them, where do you see yourself and why? Is it because you're scared? Is it because you feel stuck? Is it because you don't know what the unknowns ahead are? So telling your team, listen, there, yes, there are a lot of unknowns. First, know where you stand. Have some insights in terms of where you are in that process of adaptation. Second, you really have to choose your mindset because it, 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 the most painful part about going through anything, especially a crisis, is the, the emotional, psychological part of uh, dealing with this situation. It's, it's energy draining and it really takes a lot out of us to, to deal with. So that's why we need the plan, that's why we need the insights so that we can have a clearer mind. But choosing the mindset is probably the first step in what anybody, these are all things that we control to quickly adapt to change. Um, not only do you have to choose your mindset, it has to be a, a mindset of wanting to change, right? It has to be a mindset of realizing that yes, there are challenges, but there also are things that are in our control. So as a leader, the second thing you can discuss with your team is assessing the impact. Believe it or not, even if it's bad news, the team wants to know what is the potential impact. If not, if we don't fill in that gap, they make their own stories in their minds and they create more fear. So uh, this is a potential risk and this is why communication needs to really be open um, in order to do this. Being decisive is also critical. So being decisive uh, doesn't mean being right. We're not always right. And when we have to make decisions quickly, as a leader, we have to realize, and we also have to share with our teams that we're not always gonna be able to make the right decisions, but we're gonna stand behind our decisions and we're gonna really try to get all the right information to make the decisions. And we're gonna make them together so that even when it's the wrong decisions, those are also going to be addressed. So just being able to do that for and with our team, with the process, really helps the process to be um, better uh, and much easier for the team to accept, even when it's a difficult situation. You know, the good news about even difficult situations, especially something like this, people become more um, open to suggestions. They become more open to new options. They become more open to being accepting of um, maybe changes taking place within the company, maybe changes you've all, always wanted to make in your company, you can finally make those changes. Um, so it's not always uh, bad news. There's many, many good opportunities and I'll share a few more examples of what people are doing to, to make it an opportunity and then do what's in their control to manage the more difficult situation. Next, building your plan. We'll talk about that and give you some concrete examples in a minute. And then if you need to pivot your business, because many of my clients are design-built companies, some are strictly design-built and with no maintenance. Well, they realize that if they had a maintenance side to their business now, um, it would probably be to their advantage because they would have repeat, repeat work, repeat customers, and this is very helpful, especially when, if people uh, do not invest, invest as much in, in maybe um, construction or, um, or this side of, of the landscape. Doesn't mean it's gonna be the case, but there's definitely an advantage of pivoting a little bit, being more flexible in times like this. So looking at the options are very important. I'll give you a couple more examples later on. And then self-care, right? the team together can take care of each other. A person can take care of um, its person. So if, for example, when we're in an airplane, you'll hear the, um, the announcer or the pilot say, or, uh, or 
it could be just the um, the assistants on board that will say, listen, if something happens in case of emergency, put the mask on you first and then on your children after. It's because you got to take care of yourself before um, you got to have that oxygen. You got to make sure that you are breathing correctly to be able to to help anybody else. And this is the same case. In order, if I use the analogy of a top athlete, that athlete, yes, of course, he has to train, he has to exercise, but he has to keep he has to keep his health, his brain healthy. He has to keep his um, his body well nourished. And so, there's a lot of things that we uh, might neglect, but by doing that, you also have to realize that you're by doing this, you are actually contributing to the vicious cycle of um, not being able to perform at your best in tough times. So, food for thought on this um, on this side of things. So, to start winning here, I'm just gonna move something here. So, start by winning the battle of your mind, and like I said. Previously, the biggest battle probably in adapting and having to change is the battle of your mind and with your mind. And just knowing that it's a it's a separate thing that you have to take control over. You have to realize in which state you are in. You have to ask yourself before starting every day with your team, which state am I, which state of mind am I in? And can I find a better state of mind? And doing this regularly will keep you on your toes to make better decisions um, and, and for your business. Uh, I heard Jackie Hart, my friend Jackie, uh, saying this the other day in her webinar. I don't know if it's her quote or somebody else's, but, um, but she's very wise. And we were talking about getting to the results with less effort, with less struggle. And she said, judgment keeps us uh, keeps us stuck. Acceptance moves us forward. So there's nothing more true than um, when we start judging a situation, being stuck in that state of even judging other people. Because when we judge other people, really what we're doing is uh, we may not understand what they're doing or what's happening and that's why we judge it and that's not a place of uh, action it's not a place where we're actually being proactive so in order to be proactive and like I said to be more in a pattern that's actually going to be helpful for you to deal with the situation you need to be in that state of mind of acceptance and acceptance will will move you forward a lot quicker and your team also so getting your team to be in this state is really your goal as a, as a leader is to have people believe in your new vision, in your new mission, and where you want to go. I'm just gonna... One great example of this, um, my friend uh, Nathan Elder from Gelderman Landscape Services, he, uh, a few weeks back, I remember having the conversation with him and he was very honest, very genuine about his situation and said, listen, this has been one of the toughest weeks of my life. I have to make some hugely impactful, important, and in some cases, sad decisions. It's going to have an impact on my team. And when you have a team at full capacity of over 100, let's say 175 employees like he does or, or did in the past, it's um, it's going to have a big impact. He has a lot of decisions on every side of his business, on the financial side, on the equipment side, operational, staffing, all this. Uh, it's going to go through a major shift. So he has to assess every single department, every single position, everything to, to make the plan. So my next question to him was, well, how do you deal with this and what's the first thing that you do? Well, in this situation, in order to adapt the situation, his biggest tool was taking a look at, okay, how do we preserve cash flow, right? It's all about, in this case, cash is king, right? So how do we preserve as much as possible because we don't know how much or how long we'll need to hold on to it, uh, how much of it, how much of that money we'll need and for how long. So he created this plan and um, shares it with, with people openly 
uh, also as a consultant for Subro Consulting. I think this is one of the best uh, pieces of information really for someone who may feel a bit lost, actually for every business owner, just to, to get direction in where, where you can go uh, financially and how you can organize or take a look at your financials. So one of the things he did first was look at, um, get a systems view of his business. So he's really looking at, okay, in which state of mind are we in right now? Are we in a negative state of mind or positive state of mind? Um, he also looked at, okay, what's gonna be the new normal for our company? And so he reviewed his business, his clients, um, and really tried to take a look at okay, how much do we um, plan or how much do we think we're gonna lose in revenue? So the next step, readjusting everything to make sense of the business with less revenue. And so making different plans, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. And then taking some time to recession proof his business was also a step in, in this situation. So the systems are on this. So the focus on the type of services he offers and to know how it's gonna pack every division of his business. Uh, getting real close to his customers, finding out where they were, um, where they're at and how it's gonna impact his, uh, his business. Communication with his clients, his staff. Then it was, it's, it's all about uh, cutting costs, right? Taking a look at, looking at the lines, uh, it could be line of uh, communication with the suppliers, uh, ask the staff for their input on where they think their the company's losing money. Um, the, 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 the must haves and uh, what are the nice to have? So the essentials versus non-essential in their business. Looking at the credit cards, any recurring uh, monthly charges or subscriptions to, to assess if it's needed anymore, or do we put it on pause, right? Uh, the layoffs uh, versus carrying staff. There might be staff that you want you to keep, uh, but you can't keep. There might be staff that you need to keep, and that's going to mean a cost of the business and um, and some people might have to, to get laid off which which he had to do um, contacting his insurance company and taking a look at lower premiums because less revenue meant less cost in insurance also so saving a bit money there uh, three cash flow and projections so really take he really looked at his business and now is well he tracks a lot of things but now especially tracking daily, uh, weekly, monthly, making sure that those KPIs related to cash flow and financials are very, very, uh, they're very tight on this side of things. Then um, creating or uh, creating ways of improving cash flow. So the next step is looking at, okay, are there eligible grants from the government, let's say. So depending in Canada, we have different grants, uh, but very similar in some circumstances to the U.S., but different programs for students, for the company, so business loans, uh, wage subsidies, uh, and also maybe deferring the payments on the equipment, uh, negotiating new terms with suppliers, ensuring that um, uh, requesting clients uh, to pay, pay, pay maybe more upfront, but uh, also offering, making the, the, the client feel comfortable with his purchase it's kind of a balance of both right the client wants to know that you're not going out of business and that's going to be one of um, one of the things i want to talk about shortly is uh make, as part of the sale process to make everyone feel comfortable and then uh cutting fixed cost right taking a look at all the costs in the business and then um one of the main things that i've done with my clients i know uh, Nathan has done it with his business and his consulting business is uh, rebudgeting based on different scenarios. So I call it the, I've heard that term, I think from George Rivari saying the red, um, yellow and, 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 and green budget. So one budget where you're still in, in good shape might be 10% less revenue, 10 to 20% less. If you're still surviving, you can cut in a couple places and you can still be um, easily uh, you know, break even or maybe in the, the, the black as in the 
have some profit, right? Then you might be you might have a yellow budget with maybe 30% less revenue, uh, making more cuts in there, looking at your essentials versus non-essential, and maybe cutting more of the non-essential in that case. And then you have the red budget where it might be a struggle. There's a lot of cuts. There's uh, a lot of things that you may have to move or change or adapt to. And in that red budget, um, maybe 50% less revenue, right? Um, so he did the same for his team. And a few weeks ago, he was at around 30%, estimating maybe 30% less revenue this year. So adjusting his budget for that. And then looking at the new norm, um, taking a look at upgrading the vision for the business, building a new strategic plan post-COVID, right? What does it look like, the business? Getting clarity on this reality. So right now, we're just trying to get by, get some information. But in a few months from now, when the second quarter of the year hits, what does it mean for the economy when we go back to work? Uh, since we're going back most likely in a way that's not just full-blown open uh, for business, what does it mean for us, right? And so does it mean keeping every everything as is or really changing business, adapting the business, maybe outsourcing some services, uh, core business functions like HR, accounting, bookkeeping, uh, IT, right? They're all just examples. Then you can form buying groups, maybe to save money, getting creative that way. He, he's looking at these options. Um, identifying his skills was a big thing. Uh, he was He's able now to, to uh, grow his consulting side because of services he offers that every business needs, right? Taking care of bookkeeping and all these things are just examples, but um, there's a need out there and he's able to also uh, assess whether he wants to do that because it's one of his strengths. And so every business out there can do the same in, in your business looking at maybe possibilities, what's available out there. Acquisitions, so there's be, gonna be a lot of people wanting to sell their business. So when we think it's a good time to sell, sometimes it's a good time to buy, especially if you have more cash flow, you're in a better position financially, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities for sure. And then um, he's big on taking action, making an action, some action items, three minimum per day, sticking to these action items uh, to keep him uh, right on part to where he wants to be with the new normal and uh, taking action on a daily basis with his team and really putting emphasis on that. And then preparing for setbacks, being real, being realistic that you might have a drop of revenue, but then you might have a big drop um, if the economy really shifts in another direction. Maybe it won't happen. Maybe we'll go back to work. And But realistically, we have to plan for different scenarios. So this was one of uh, an insightful conversation, I think, that uh, having that with Nathan was very, uh, really opened me up to to his ways, uh, how he's coping with his business. So this is, this is one great company. Uh, innovative but also action taker right another example of this is planets uh, the planets group in uh, landscape group in Montreal uh, when Glenn Curtis the owner called me he is very innovative always on top of things he's got one of the best uh, design studio that I've ever seen he actually meets his clients there for his uh, part of the sales process, his clients come to him and um, they build the plan. Um, they have the discussions, uh, conceptualization. It's all done at their office usually. So for him, uh, this situation really forced him to get out of his comfort zone and really look at the way he was doing business. So what we've done, um, he knew more than ever that his systems his tracking, his metrics were gonna be super important. So he actually invested extra money um, into reshaping the way he was uh, tracking his stuff. So he uses LMN for everything um, from his budgeting to uh, his sales, during his sales process for quoting jobs, invoicing. And part of it was, um, you know, he was looking at it and trying to see how he could be more efficient. So he knows that what is measured gets managed. 
So he said, if we get better at tracking, better at having that information that we really, really need, the more this is gonna help the business um, stay up to par with what's going on, what we can actually do, what we actually have, and not have an illusion that's not there. So he wanted to be to the fine point. So he took action on this, on, on, on really addressing that in his business. And so we looked at his LMN, brought on uh, George Rivari, who's in my opinion, one of the best at, uh, at, at building um, budgets and really taking a look at all the components. And so they looked at different things like, uh, okay, our sales process, right? Which is all part of, building, of looking at a budget, building a, a, an accurate or more accurate budget. Um, and when we're creating different budget scenarios, we're looking, okay, the potential sales, what could change there? The job costs, what's gonna affect our job costs? Well, we have to think about the field wages, the equipment costs, the material costs, uh, subcontractor costs, right? And then what's the overhead? So in a good economy, we you know can handle certain uh, a certain amount of overhead. So looking at his business, we were looking at all kinds of stuff, from his uh, personal use stuff to the business uh, things to and we were talking about equipment. We were talked about uh, his machines. He, he has some wonderful machines. Uh, has adapted over the years. Um, uses um, you know different techniques, uh, different crews. But they don't. They might not need all that equipment if he uh, he decides to operate differently. And so right now it's just looking at the options, being prepared. But especially if we want to uh, thrive, we need to be lean. And so he wanted to really focus on running a lean business. And this is in his. I guess in, he very he really valued um, doing this exercise together, and uh, and using LMN to to really its capacity. So uh, it's it's pretty impressive seeing a guy who's been in business for 40 years with all his wisdom, his experience. He goes back to the basic the basics and says, "Listen, let's do the exercise. I know it's important." And you can challenge me on some, on some stuff. So being open to being um, challenged, playing the devil's advocate, taking a look at things as they are and being really true, being accountable, that's a healthy exercise to have um, before uh, the situation actually happens. It's a lot tougher to do this exercise when things um, are happening or get uh, bad. <laughs> Excuse me. And this is not his budget, but it's just to show you a little bit you know, how how clear it is uh, when you use uh, software because it gives you all the information, right? It's all there. You can go through um, your budgeting info. You have different tabs where you can take a look at your fields. You can easily change information, input your information. Uh, do uh, do different budget scenarios so different using different templates and and change it up to see what it gives you um, for numbers to see if it still makes sense right so I just like that I think it's a great partnership having um, element and the tools that they offer uh, and some of these tools are, are absolutely free but and so useful so for me every business out there every business that I work with we've been doing budget scenarios. So to me, it's a, it's a big must, and it was a big must to uh, Glenn of his company. Other things that we've been working on to hey, really Frank. read the things. Yeah. Hi, it's Dave here. I just wanted to jump in with a with a question that came in from, from one of the attendees, um, and it probably applied um, to a couple of your previous slides, but that's okay. You don't need to, to move anything around. In the coaching that you're doing, Frank, and obviously, in the tools and the strategies that you're sharing with everybody today. These are certainly applicable in both a strong economy as well as maybe you know a weaker economy, which is fantastic. But more specifically, when you're talking about budgeting and looking at the numbers in the, in the coaching that you're doing, are you finding that um, you're advising 
corporations to look at the numbers more often now, um, where maybe they, you know, in in previous years, uh, in the month of April, uh, would build a budget for the month of April and then, you know, get to work in in the field. Are you mm -hmm. finding that there's there's more recalibration and and retooling and and revisiting uh, the that's budget numbers? Absolutely, it's such a good question and. Uh, that's, a, that's an absolute yes for me. I think uh, the more uncertain or unstable the situation, the more you have to, uh, it's always important to keep track, but it's even more so, even more important to do so when things are unstable, just to make sure that you don't lose track of what's happening, um, that you stay to the fine point of your numbers to track your numbers more than ever. Um, for instance, you know the time that uh, you may be spending on jobs. Um, everything has to be managed and assessed in terms of risk. When you're living a risky situation, I think you have to manage the risk. So you have to look at everything: your your clients, your employees, your business, uh, the jobs you're doing, your purchases. Everything has risk. And if anything is low to medium risk. Well, great. If anything, you look in your business is high risk. It could be, um, for instance, doing a consultation with a client who said, well, I only do a few jobs, high-end jobs per year. And to me, he runs a much higher risk business um, than someone who has uh, 200 uh, maintenance uh, contracts and diversifies with a few construction contracts and, um, you know, contracts in with various amounts so that uh, there's more cash flow. Bigger jobs sometimes also means less cash flow depending on how you get paid. So really assessing the situation in terms of risk and keeping track of everything is uh, and more tightly the more risk I guess you're living in, in your situation. This is a great example of yes you may have to adjust your budget over and over again. You may even have to do it again in a couple of months from now, if the situation improves or if the situation gets worse than what you had anticipated, or if you do a few budget scenarios, then at least you have some options and you can reassess as you go. But having the knowledge is actually your power in this situation. This is the part that I think the business owner control can gain more control. So with the planning group, with, with Glenn and his team, we really looked at, okay, the budget scenarios, we reviewed his systems. So now he realized that with the physical distancing, he would have to adapt. Uh, in 40 years, never did the video conferencing. And all of a sudden he realizes, well, geez, I like meeting people face to face, but if that's not gonna happen or not as often, or maybe people won't be as comfortable, I have to offer options. So uh, getting him to use Zoom was was uh, great. He uh, and actually he was surprised how easy it is to use and how it's still providing some results. So if he can get the job done in different ways, it helps him, it's another tool um, that he can use. And also when we're talking about um, services, so he does a lot of uh, landscape construction, he's got maintenance. We also review whether or not he should get more maintenance contracts, uh, repeatable work like this to grow that side of the business. So that was one of his strategies. The marketing side of it, a lot of people are actually taking money, slowing down the marketing. He was going the opposite direction, saying, no, I'm gonna keep investing. I want uh, to put money in my Google AdWords just because I'm ranking high now. There seems to be less, uh, less landscapers there, so I'm appearing higher on the rankings. So, um, you know, very good logic, and other professionals and consultants in the industry would say the same thing stay top of mind for people and your clients to make sure that your clients know you're there, that you're uh, looking and planning to thrive and that you're not just trying to survive because nobody wants to take a chance. Your employees uh, realize that it's a different, uh, difficult situation or can be. Uh, they don't need to know that you, or they don't have to think that you have no fear. Uh, fear is important and, and voicing it is important, but voicing out the plan is more so, even more important because people want to follow someone who, who at least has a sense of direction than someone who appears frozen, right? So again, it comes back to the different patterns and style 
where you're at in adapting. Then uh, his design sales process, and so now he's looking at doing a whole video setup for his design sales studio that he could use virtually. And so that could help him um, maybe with his sales process on top of using Zoom. And uh, also future-proofing the business uh, is one of his, I, I guess by doing all this, he's, he's doing this. Um, but um, doing the exercise, he would tell you is not pleasant. It's not necessarily exciting, but the exciting part of it is when you, once you go through it, you realize that you have more control than sometimes you think before doing the exercise. So there's a lot more things possible uh, and even ideas coming out of that process, uh, which is important in, in, my, in, in my opinion. Um, my next example is Leger Landscapes out of Montreal. So a client of mine who uh, I've worked, I've seen him grow his business and uh, just over eight months, almost uh, double his revenue. Actually, he doubled, uh, almost tripled, or yeah, at least doubled his business in just eight months and working on, on staying healthy as a business. So for him, um, he looked at what he was uh, his strengths, he looked at his weaknesses and he said, you know, there's a lot of things um, that we do well that I'm willing to do and he's, a, he's an innovator all the way. So he wasn't afraid of, uh, of uh, automation and um, using technology to, to uh, better his business. So not only has he started to use Zoom for virtual uh, meetings with his clients and quoting process. He automated the process. So he's in hardscape restoration, so repairs, right? Uh, and in cleaning for hardscapes. And so for him, it's possible, he, he has been able to create a process um, where everything is, is automatic. So from using Zoom to Loom for uh, recording his screen and being able to share video files with his clients easily just by a link, uh, and which I'll show you a couple examples in a second, using Trello for his team. So bringing all that information once he sells the job to uh, his team, having it all in one place, response a bid. Uh, so all the leads that come his way, he is able to put it on autopilot where people um, uh, can, can pick some options. Um, it brings you then through the process and then really provides a price for the client very quickly. Not only that, it follows up with clients based on the ones who are not uh, interested, uh, those who are interested, those who have signed, and also it brings reminders later on throughout the year for maintenance and all these things. So it, his strong point was implementation. He would say that his weak point was probably the follow-ups because it was so busy, but he knows he's gonna be able to uh, get more sales by putting things in, in and automating the process and also the follow-up process. And so um, so he's worked on marketing, his sales and future-proofing his business as well. And this is an example of him showing a client um, just by using uh, Google, a Google view basically, uh, the street view, uh, showing the client, okay, here's your house, here's what we're gonna do. Um, by using a sketching tool that's available through that, just it's called the snipping tool. I'm just trying to read the screen, a snipping tool, and so he's able to draw, explain the quote. So on the bottom right of your screen, you'd see like the quote there that he's it's explaining at the client at the same time, um, sharing the information, the same information that would do in person. Now he would get that lead through the response bid. So when the client contacts his business, whether it's through the website or by phone call, um, this can be filled out easily. So the client information, um, the basically it's a three-step process. So the first step is the um, just the basic information. Then the client can choose if it's, let's say, on the website, he can create his own quote. And again, it's not possible for every business. It's possible for his business the way he's done it. Um, but he, there's many uh, there's many uh, things that he had to consider to build it this way, but so the client chooses um, the, the, the area of the project. He also indicates, okay, what type of pavers, that's the second step, and then the client can 
um, the client can then go to step three and provide more information, like if they can send pictures, uh, if they've done restoration before, uh, if there's an irrigation system, a pool. All these questions are asked because then he would charge more for the job based on um, the circumstances, right? Um, and then the last step is just providing uh, the, uh, the information on the location. So based on where they're located, uh, there's, a, there's more cost depending on the distance. And then they can click to get a quote. So in the contract, uh, you know, it states that it's an estimate and that if they want to, they can get one done in person, um, but it may vary based on the circumstances, but it, it, it can get very accurate too. Uh, but it provides option to the client. So if the client is just interested to get a price, at least it, it gives that first uh, interaction and, uh, and info. Then the next screen would be the contract uh, and different payment options with different upgrades. And also what's important, which I think we need to do, or at least think about doing is providing payment options for clients that they feel good about. And not only that, but that kind of protects you. So finance it is an option um, that he uses available in Canada for sure. And there's different ones throughout the Canada and the US, but you can offer different payment options, but basically when you, you finish the job, you get paid to finance it and you don't have to deal with collecting and all these things, right? And you can offer different payment options. Let's, last night he was telling me that for like a three months, um, no, uh, no easy, uh, no, so, so three months, no payments. And then um, I guess the interest varies depending on the plan, but in this case, it only costs him to his business 3%. So it's almost the same cost of a, like a credit card uh, transaction, right? So 3%, so the client gets three months, no payments. So that could be a big plus. There's other payments like 0% uh, interest for 12 months. I believe that's like 5% cost to the business owner. So a little bit more, but maybe your client uh, needs it and you're willing to offer it. Uh, they're just examples, but that's what he's done in his business to provide more option to his clients and to, uh, to facilitate the process, the sales process. Another great example is Wentworth Landscape, uh, Landscapes uh, out of the Toronto area. Uh, great, great guy. Sky got to know him the last uh, few years and, and um, very wise man with a lot of uh, experience. And I've heard him say this last, uh, or yesterday actually, and I called him up, I said, can I use this because, um, I know as a business owner, you're, you're doing some, some uh, pretty creative stuff right now. And uh, he said, you know, in times, in these times, the message needs to change. It's not about the sale. It's about what we can give and how we can contribute and how we can serve, right? And when he says that, um, I know he not only means it, but he is an action taker. He, he a man of his word and what he suggests he does, right? He's doing it, he's not just saying it. And so one of the new initiatives, opportunities that he found in his business, because people were open to it now and there's more time to do it, is uh, he developed the professional development um, team, um, I'm just gonna find the word here, team challenge, right? So a team challenge, professional development team challenge. And so what they're doing is uh, they've created this interesting way of their staff to uh, partner up into, uh, so they're accountable to each other as teams. So, and they get one point for every 50 minutes of learning that they do. So they can read a book, look at a seminar, uh, take an online course, and they get uh, one point for every 15 minutes. And then they, they keep track of the, the points two times a week, um, Wednesdays and Fridays at noon. And then you can, they can win a gift certificate of $100. So on a weekly basis, it makes it fun. It gamifies the whole uh, learning aspect of it. But I think it's a great way to build that culture of growth, uh, personal growth and business growth in a business. So educating people in a fun way, I think, is, is absolutely innovative and a must not only is he doing that, but he's also um, providing uh, training on crisis management, 
and financial planning. So to me, that was a huge, uh, I provided like a huge aha moment for me because realizing that if every business provided more financial planning education to their staff, that would be a huge advantage uh, on the long run because not only are they making better decisions for uh, the business, but for their families, for themselves, that's going to help them cope with any situation uh, better if they are in a better financial position and if they're making better decisions in a crisis, so just like the ones that we've discussed earlier on in this webinar, uh, just knowing where you are in the process of adaptation, the process of change, knowing where you're resisting, knowing um, what's ahead and assessing the impact is all part of this. So he's doing that with his team. I thought it was really creative. Uh, he's doing so because he can, because the timing is right, because people are open to it. So finding out what people in your business, uh, what your people are open to doing is um, also very important to, to find out at this point in time because you might be able to, to do more for them and with them. Um, Atlas Outdoor, uh, Sam Gamble, a great friend of mine with a team of over uh, 80 employees. I called them up and I said, Sam, um, what uh, are you doing at this moment for your team? Are you know like are you going back to work? Are you planning on going back to work? And he said, uh, you know what, we're gonna not gonna force the agenda. Okay, right now my priority is to serve our people and to provide them with what they need. And he is so focused on that right now. He's put all his personal growth and his own needs aside. And, he makes sure that on a daily basis, his team is, um, they have what they need. Uh, you know, he'll provide food even if they need it. Uh, for those who can't, um, who don't, uh, uh, I guess, qualify for uh, unemployment, make sure they, they, they're doing well and that they're okay. But in order to do that, he had to look at his business, right? So he had to do a bit like uh, Gelderman where he had to increase the cash in the bank, make sure that, He's cutting what he needs to cut, but to keep the money intact and, and collect on any money that's due to the business. Uh, constant updates to his clients to make sure he's staying close, to make sure the clients feel good about the situation and dealing with his business. Um, and his team also, a constant updates with his team. Reducing all the expenses, taking part in all the government programs that he can take part of. Um, and also, what I find that was really innovative, he created a communications team. So taking each team leader is in charge of so many people. They, they have Zoom meetings every day. They talk about different things to get the feel, to get the pulse of every employee, to try to find out like if they have all, uh, if all their needs are taken care of, making sure that nobody's hungry and nobody's running out of money. Uh, people, if they need help to apply for different things that they can, like assistance or unemployment. And so just found that really good that he gets daily updates from his leaders, checking in with his team, um, having these important conversations and to make sure they're updated on where the company's going uh, and what the decisions are being made uh, in the business. So <laughs> my next question uh, for reflection to you today is what's the silver lining? What's your silver lining? Because there's, a, there's an opportunity for every business and you just have to look um, at the situation in a different way. For these people, let's say, let's take a look at Gardens of Babylon out of Nashville. I saw this um, through um, another consultant in the, in the industry who mentioned this example here, Jeffrey Scott, and he said, you know, dealing with this company, they didn't have an online uh, garden center, but they had to create it based on the fact that their sales dropped 85% um, just with phone orders. So by doing this, they pivoted their business online. They did. They built the head, head website or that uh, online uh, store in two weeks, and now their sales online are equal to the daily uh, store sales, with more potential for growth, obviously online, right? And so I find that pretty clever and um, innovative for uh, this company. They pivoted just like we can all do. Uh, Morales Masonry Landscaping, he had to pivot a couple years back when his biggest challenge became his health and the physical strain was taking on him, investing in better equipment. Uh, he was able to triple his business within, within three years 
just with better equipment and now he doesn't need as much employees or he can do more with the same amount of employees uh, just using you know some of the equipment he has uh, just one machine he bought he was able to triple his production uh, production on um, slab insulation such as with the Unilift right so installing triple the amount with just one guy compared to what he was able to do before um, uh, with three guys or four guys was uh, a big uh, game changer for him. I saw this post the other day from Cole Landscaping, great company, innovative, uh, just you know showing his uh, on social media for his clients, his teams, everyone out there that uh, you know they they've installed this a system for disinfecting, right? So um, it sends a strong message. It, if you take it serious, if you're all in as a company. All these little things that you do that are innovative and showing that you're in, you're adapting uh, will give you that advantage uh, and also the right exposure that you want as a business. So adapting quickly to change, what you can do is you can focus on your mindset. Find out where you are at, at in the process of change and adaptation. Um, take a look if you're a, a hider, uh, if you're hiding. Um, maybe behind your be behind uh, the real issues, the problems. Um, if you're trying to avoid, if you're just an observ observer, are you actually taking action? Are you connect? You're making the right connections, seeking the right help, or uh, even on the innovation side, what are you doing? Are you on on that side of things, proactive side of things? Uh, also assessing the impact on a daily, weekly, maybe monthly basis. Uh, things are changing rapidly, so. The more it's changing, the more you should assess. Being decisive. People want to follow a leader, like I said, who knows, who has at least a direction and a vision of where he wants to go and bring the business. Uh, people fall into more fear and have less, are less likely to follow along with, <laughs> with someone who is stuck in, in fear and not taking action. Uh, building a plan, very important in sharing that plan pivoting as needed, like I mentioned. And again, self-care is gonna be uh, important for, for, for everyone to, for the long run, we're gonna need uh, lots of energy to, to cope. Just like I said, emotionally and psychologically, sometimes it, it takes more energy than what we actually need physically to do. But um, so self-care is super important. And what I can help you with and what you can use as a checklist for uh, crisis management is things that um, that I can help you with or that you can do to help is make sure your financials are up to date, perform a SWOT analysis to take a look at the strengths, the weaknesses, um, the opportunities, maybe the threats uh, on the business uh, and, 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 I'll, and I'll, uh, doing an assessment and analyzing with your team what that looks like for a business. Um, reviewing and modifying your strategic plan. Um, team meetings, recap, update plans, uh, working on a system that works for your business, uh, communication systems with your key people, making sure you have that in place and uh, that you're, you're, you're really focused on the team. And then uh, and, and giving them all this information that you have now uh, that can help you um, help them adapt. And then tracking and monitoring KPIs. Uh, very, very important, you know, KPIs from, we talked a lot about the financial side of it today, but it could be on the field, what's going on there. It could be uh, on marketing, what's working, what not, what's not working, um, just basically to help you manage your risk. So, so knowing your numbers to help you manage your risk. So I want to thank you on this. Uh, hopefully this helped. I would really love for anyone who wants to connect on social media to do so. If I can help uh, with any of the things that I've mentioned today. Uh, I'm offering 20 minutes uh, to anyone. You just have to reach out to me and I'll, we can get on a call or um, a Zoom meeting and, and talk about your situation. And if it's just a thought, great. And uh, if, it is, if it's for more, great. So my website, frankboard.com, frank at frankboard.com is my email and you can reach me directly. So thanks Dave and, and Lisa for uh, the opportunity uh, to have me here today. and. Uh, uh, to all of you, all the best for the season ahead. That's excellent, Frank. Thank you so much for your time.
um, a wealth of, of knowledge and that presentation was, was power packed. We will make sure that everybody receives a copy um, and has the opportunity to, to follow up with you um, and any additional questions or, or coaching that, um, uh, that you may be able to help them with. Um, one final closing slide um, for our audience members, as you know, um, providing online education uh, to help all of the landscapers that we work with become even better business people is our number one goal at LMN. Um, and in 2020, we uh, have taken uh, that online education um, opportunity to the next level. We've moved our, our workshops online for greater access. Um, all of our uh, academy courses are now as well online and we continue to uh, provide companies with a really, really, really strong education uh, supported by our incredible um, staff. So our support team is um, ready, uh, chat, email, phone. Um, our crew really wants to work with, with everybody uh, during these times, as Frank said, it's about the numbers. Let's help you uh, manage the components that you need in the business. Um, because once it's it's measured, um, then you can manage it appropriately. So Frank, thank you again. And for all of the attendees, enjoy the rest of this week. Good luck. Thank you.